So, welcome to my seventh edition of a podcast produced for the Pythagorean Order of Death, of course. It's the P.O.D. cast, the podcast. And this is the seventh episode. It's going to be the sixth Ask Me Anything episode and the third with questions provided by old friend of the brand, Andrus Lux. Need I say more? So if you'll allow me, I'll jump right into the questions. The first question is, what is a soul specifically? And my reply, for a human being, their soul is the approximately 100 watt electromagnetic energy field generated within their living body on average while at rest. Other species of life form produce different amounts of electrical charge. For example, a single citrus fruit is capable of producing an electrical charge of 0.9 volts. The so-called gut bacteria, Listeria monocyto monocytogenes, a gram-positive bacteria native to a flavin-rich environment, generates some 100,000 electrons per second per cell. And even a modern cell phone battery holds a charge of, at most, 5 watts. The difference between a living person, a citrus fruit, a gut biome bacteria, and a cell phone is only in degree of freedom or capacity for self-awareness and, to a lesser extent, the ability to self-motivate. Because the human nervous system usually uses only about 10% of its total possible network bandwidth, that is, that 100 watts of electricity inside the living human body only takes up about 10% of the total number of neuron cells available, people can think independently, move their bodies, invent technologies, adapt and evolve, etc. In short, the soul of a human being can alter itself in ways its electrical circuitry does not allow for in a cell phone. For example, when you pull the plug or remove the battery from an electronic machine, it immediately loses all functionality as such. However, in the case of the soul leaving a dying person, the process usually takes longer, and even after the spark has ceased pulsing one's cardiac fibrillation, the brain can hold enough oxygen to continue electrically powering its cells for at least 10 minutes prior to irreparable brain damage resulting and even longer until its very last gasp of oxygen is exhausted. While the electrical charge in the living body is diminishing, the essence or soul of that person is experiencing either dissolution of itself into the primary clear light of tachyons in the zero-point energy field of hyperspace as the electricity that had been trapped into the patterns of the living being's body dissipates into the luminiferous ether, or else it is preserved as a pattern of electromagnetic potential independently of the body that had been generating and sustaining it as such. The lifelong patterns taken by the electrical charge of the soul 
while it inhabits the living body, are unique to each different individual. But the template patterns of all people's souls is essentially the same. A Taurus. So we say a soul is the Taurus-shaped electromagnetic energy field surrounding and permeating a living being's body, and that the spirit is the universal shape of this template form. So a soul, as a unique pattern of electromagnetic energy, may survive bodily death if it is able to inhabit a spirit, a Taurus-shaped tachyon field. In his next question, how does karma relate to one's soul? Karma are the quanta or particulate form of chi energy, which is in turn equivalent to the ether energy of the tachyon field of hyperspace. This is to say chi or ether is the fifth element as an energy field and units of karma are the particles of this force. As such, karma can be either good or bad. That is, clockwise rotating karma particles may be lucky to an individual, while counterclockwise spinning particles of karma may be unlucky to them. But this is not a universal rule, however, as one person's bad luck is usually another person's good luck and vice versa. The fact that karma may be lucky or unlucky for a person indicates there is a finite quantity of luck to go around. That is, the local field of chi is of a permanent fixed amount so the more one person accesses it the less everyone else is able to do so simultaneously in short one person's good karma requires in short one person's good karma requires evil karma to befall the masses surrounding them and vice versa because karma is finite Insofar as psi, or the psychic potential of an individual person's mind, is able to dissolve into and navigate itself about within this hyperspace field of zero-point chi or ether energy, independently of its host body's more or less inert stationary location, while remote viewing or astral traveling, the mind of the individual may be able to manipulate the karma particles of this energy field directly and thus induce change to occur on larger scales of matter telekinetically. Psi as a measure of the individual's psi as a measure of an individual mind's psychic potential is the sum of all the patterns of electrical energy taken by the soul over its lifetime, and, as such, comprised of a subtler, smaller, and faster force than the electromagnetic soul or aura of the individual at any given moment in time. Psi is for the mind of the individual, while alive, alike what the spirit or Taurus-shaped tachyon field is for the electromagnetic soul, and just as the unique patterns of the EM aura while alive are the soul and the mind of the individual, so too are particles of karma one and the same substance as the zero-point energy field of hyperspace. Ultimately, all of these things are one and the same thing the electromagnetic soul as an ego on the one hand, and the tachyon field spirit as hyperspace on the other, are already one and the same substance. So, in short, 
one's soul is made of karma. One's surrounding aura is like an electromagnet. One's surrounding aura is like an electrostatic membrane that attracts and collects karma. His next question is, how do you clear negative karma? Negative karma is only negative from the perspective of the individual experiencing it. Likewise with positive karma. The karma itself may be the same either way, but the subjective experience of the same situation may differ depending on one's point of view. In addition to being responsible for how we view our own local karmic influence or soul for ourselves, we, those souls of beings who have evolved sentience or will, are also responsible for how we apply our personal karma or soul to the environment and others around us. So our inner mind may be purged of guilt, that symptom of negative karma, without it affecting how the karma of our soul is perceived by others. A sociopath, for example, may not feel guilty for their crimes in the traditional sense, but they are still considered guilty of committing those crimes in the eyes of the law. So to clear one's aura of negative karma requires more than just cleaning up one's interior perceptions. One must also do good deeds to attract positive karma to replace the negative. Thus, karma may be both passive or psychological and active or intentional, as well as both negative or evil and positive or good, and all these depend on the perspective of the individual. <clears throat> Thus, one looking out from within their living aura sees karma imposed upon them from the world around, but from a point of view anywhere outside that individual's aura, it is the individual that is imposing their own karma onto the world. It may be impossible for any mortal to have perfect karma and a completely clear conscience. One might never fully escape casting their own shadow. However, when one's negative karma is minimized and kept to the rear of one's aura, and one prioritizes the positive karma in their aura by putting it forward and looking ahead, one may function with an essentially clear mind and conscience, suffering minimal obscuration from negative karma. His next question. What is Lemuria in general? And furthermore, what is the Lemurian bank in POD material. The name Lemuria comes from zoologist Philip Sclater, who in 1864 proposed the idea of Maritia, a Precambrian microcontinent that was situated between India and Madagascar until their separation about 70 million years ago. As accounting for the presence of lemur fossils in Madagascar and the Indian subcontinent, but not in Africa or the Middle East. Only he called this hypothesized sunken landmass Lemuria. The term was picked up on in Theosophy, and later James Churchward, 1851 until 1936 wrote extensively about it, calling it Mu for short. By now, it has become a polemic for the notion of a Pacific Ocean equivalent to Plato's lost continent of Atlantis. 
Nevertheless, paleo continent. Nevertheless, during the last ice age, when sea levels were lower, from 115,000 until 11,700 years ago, a paleo continent, which archaeologists call Sahul, that encompassed the modern day land masses of mainland Australia, Tasmania, New Guinea, and the Aru Islands, did exist. Sahul was separated from Sunda, including Bali, Borneo, Java, and Sumatra in Indonesia, and their surrounding small islands, as well as the Malay Peninsula on the Asian mainland. By the Wallachian archipelago of islands, it is estimated humans first colonized Sahul between 60,000 and 45,000 years ago, making the ocean crossing from Sunda through Wallachia. In the context of the POD material, the Lemurian epoch refers to the duration of the last North Hemisphere Ice Age. This epoch followed in the POD material, that of Atlantis, when the first global civilization of coastal dwelling seafaring hominids ruled from Antarctica, called Nibiru in later Sumerian myths. The epoch of Lemuria was predominantly defined by nomadic tribalism, as once coastal, culturally unified peoples now spread inland separately and predominantly marked by the erection of the earliest menhirs, upright stones, dolmens, lintled megaliths, and tumuli, burial mounds. So, like the Enochian communication system, that is, Earth's ionosphere, Earth's ionosphere's capacity for use as an over-the-horizon transmission medium for pulsed signals of electrical energy, is named Enochian because, I believe, its discovery predated the era of the world flood, corresponding to the end of the Younger Dryas period event some 12,850 years ago. The Lemurian economic system, or Lemurian church bank, is called such because the substance of its currency predates even the first use of cowrie shell money by the earliest Lemurians of Sahul. In the POD material, the Lemurian economic system, or Lemurian church bank, is the same thing for accessing zero-point energy as a source for a limitless supply of potential electrical power, as the Enochian communications system is, for instantly transmitting data of information across a universally shared medium. That is to say, both the ECS for communication and the Lemurian church bank depend entirely on the electromagnetic potential of Earth's ionosphere. Once knowledge has progressed to the extent we can harness infinite potential zero-point energy inside of Earth's ionosphere, then the Enochian communications system by which we have harnessed it will become the Lemurian church bank. When we have, then we will remember the lost, sacred secret of how to manifest matter out of pure mind alone, using only our existing cerebral biology. So, the Lemurian church bank is for manifestation, basically the same as the ECS is for telepathy, a medium of transmission. His fifth question. 
Do supernatural entities exist? No, not exactly. The closest approximation to supernatural entities that do exist are what I call metaphors or fourth spatial dimensional shapes made of tachyon fields of zero point energy in hyperspace. These shapes are complex and seem to retain information, but they do not appear to be alive in the same sense as a soul, which is also complex and remembers information, may be said to be alive. Their movements appear to be involuntary. Their movements appear to be involuntary. They arise like tachyon lens flare around gravity wells, such as black holes, stars, planets, moons, etc. And their motions are subject to the invisible currents of tachyon winds that churn the entropy of space-time. Because they are fourth spatial dimensional, they may apparently break certain rules governing our own three-dimensional universe with its single added direction of time. These metaform objects may break through into our universal space, partially here and now, and simultaneously, partially there and then, at some other place in space, and some other time than now, and thus serve to connect these two distant points like a wormhole or time tunnel. These metaform shapes are four space polygons, but may occasionally assume a regular pattern as well, like a tesseract or hypercube, a hypertetrahedron or simplex, and a cross polytope or orthoplex, etc. When Ezekiel perceived such shapes, he considered them a divine throne chariot made of wheels within wheels that served as a vessel containing intelligent beings, or so-called angels. When the Vedas describe the comings and goings of the Hindu deities, they describe a class of flying vessels called Vimana that they could travel through space and time in. These metaform shapes are not alive alike us, but do contain intelligence and may have originally inspired the notion of angels and aliens. These metaforms often appear to people under heavy doses of DMT or LSD as kaleidoscopic prismatic abstractions with complex encrypted information pulsing on their surfaces. Buddhists describe their psychological impact on a person who experiences them as peaceful or wrathful deities, depending entirely on one's state of mind. Terence McKenna described them as mechanical elves due to their symmetries resembling gears and their movements resembling those of miniature robotic automatons. Because these encounters are all mentally perceived, the same metaforms one person perceives with their mind's eye may remain invisible, intangible, and even ultimately ineffable to someone else who is sober and skeptical. Thus, the existence of these metaforms as supernatural entities remains an empirically unsubstantiated belief. His sixth question. What is a reality tunnel, and how can one align theirs to be accurate? In the era when people mostly rode horses for transport. There was a saying about having blinders on that referred to a person's focus being narrowed down to a single concentrated point, 
alike a horse that has had its peripheral sight impeded by blinders, so that it can only see dead ahead of itself. In the postmodern era, this phrase was essentially replaced by the term tunnel vision, and in the post-atomic era, by the term reality tunnel. The term was originally coined, I'm pretty sure, by Tim Leary as part of his concept of game reality developed in his Eight Circuits of Consciousness model. Game reality was associated with the fourth of these circuits, the sociosexual circuit, and related to society and to civilized people's behavioral affectations and taboos. Leary suggested that, by using LSD, one could metaprogram their own consciousness and thus step outside of game reality and perceive their own tunnel reality through it as being entirely their own voluntary choice, exclusively under their own control. In short, Leary's idea of a tunnel reality was that each person had their own path to walk, their own unique course through life. If one were to look at people's paths or courses they took through life collectively, it would resemble a bowl of noodles, and the surface of Earth seemed covered in an invisible layer of such incomprehensibly complex intricacies interwoven of all these reality tunnels that it would resemble a tapestry woven on the loom of time. Trying to find meaning and message in the image on this tapestry has long been one of the primary focuses of philosophy and is usually called sociology these days. Is atheism the correct worldview for the majority to hold? Are we ready to exist without a deity? If atheism were the correct worldview for the majority to hold, then the majority would hold the worldview of atheism, and the question would be moot. However, for now, because the masses are not ready to exist without a deity, the majority remain theists. I look forward, personally, to a future when nobody will think that God exists in any form, let alone that of a universal creator deity. Worshipping things will eventually fall out of favor, and so labeling any most high idea, God, will become obsolete as well. It is simply pointless to imagine such a false premise, in my opinion, but many use the God concept as a kind of crutch to support their own natural psychic abilities with the rationalized explanation of a higher power's divine intervention. So many, wrongly, feel that they need God when in fact they are only addicted to a poisonous lie and would be much better off without it. Belief in God or gods of any sort will likely take a long time for the last of us to get over, and I doubt I will be around or even remembered by then. Parapsychology. Is it legitimate science or outlandish claims via fringe scientists? Parapsychology is like the inverse of dark matter from modern astrophysics studies. Many legitimate astrophysicists search for dark matter, but none will ever find it, because it is a false premise. Just so, many fringe scientists search for evidence to substantiate psi or parapsychology, but none will ever prove it because those who do not accept that it is real are those for whom it is not. Those who deny telepathy must simply not be telepathic. While for the rest of us, simultaneously 
thinking alike is just second nature. In other words, dark matter is not real, but this fact is unprovable to those astrophysicists who currently quest for it. And so, telepathy is real, but unprovable to those who deny it, in the same way the sight of the world by daylight is impossible to demonstrate to someone whose eyes are kept tightly closed by their own choice to hide them. His next question. Are you familiar with the work of Stanislav Grof and holotropic states of consciousness? I have a few books by Grof in my personal library. The Holotropic Mind, Beyond the Brain, The Cosmic Game, and Beyond Death. I had the pleasure of attending a conference he hosted about his breathwork technique for rhythmic breathing to induce deep hypnotic trance, which is, I learned later, supposedly based on Vedic and eventually Buddhist meditative pranayama or yogic ritual breathing methods. His premise of a holotropic mind state is the brain, the mind, and the ego all functioning harmoniously, all operating at their peak capacity for awareness, essentially similar to the premise of attaining a mind state of constant nirvana. Other methods of expanding consciousness, including Leary's promulgation of acid and brainwave entrainment technologies using binaural beats, lack both the naturalistic and the independence aspects of Groff's breathwork technique, which can be performed without taking any mind-altering drugs and without relying on any artificial machines. Groff's most important work, in my opinion, is actually not related to the practice of breathwork itself, but in his research based on the results of observing this practice in hundreds of cases in his dozens of conferences. What came from this collection of data was a list of common types of experiences people have while in the altered state of consciousness induced by breathwork or pranayama yoga. He compared their hallucinated experiences during these self-induced, deep hypnotic trance state sessions and traced them all back to their single most likely source of origin, the perinatal phases in and around the traumatic experience of being born. So some people report having a good trip in which they re-experience zero gravity suspension in the amniotic fluid of the womb. Others have a bad trip in which they re-experience the breaking of this water and the rearrangement of the fetus in the womb from upright to upside down so that its head may face the cervix. Some people re-experience their own birth, feeling compressed on all sides as they are pushed out of the womb and then feeling liberated into a new and very alien atmosphere where they're surrounded by strange giant beings with medical instruments, often associated with the greys and the experience of alien abduction. Trance states. What are they, and are we constantly in them? There is definitely a spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, most of which, beyond visible light at the farthest, <clears throat> France states. What are they, and are we constantly in them? There is definitely a spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, most of which, beyond visible light at the fastest and sound waves at the slowest, we tune out, 
But is there a similar spectrum of conscious states of awareness that our ego passes between along a sliding scale from emotionally low and depressed to emotionally high and manic, which we simply tune out the rest of, depending on which trance or mind state we are in at any given moment? Or, put differently, does the ego pass through a more or less fixed cycle of finite possible emotions, manic depression, in a flow of time that is that it experiences as a series of momentary drops in the same way that, for example, the tides rise and fall due to the proximity of the moon's gravitational pull? If the emotions are pulled like the tides, then is it still the moon itself that causes this? The average menstrual cycle in female wombed mammals seems to indicate some affinity with the monthly luminosity of the moon as it revolves around the earth, although a direct correlation remains elusive. There are, indeed, varying degrees of intensity of a trance state of consciousness that exceed the normal spectrum of cognition and behavior of which we are usually aware in our mundane, sober, daily routines. For example, one feels a certain way while working a dead-end job all week and then drinks alcohol on the weekend in order to feel differently. If the job setting is dull, then the person will drink for fun. Both of these conditions induce trance states of consciousness, albeit at polar opposite ends of the spectrum from one another, the difference being that the situation of the job induces a trance of boredom onto one from without and against their will, while the condition of drinking alcohol on the weekend induces a trance of false euphoria inside oneself due to their voluntary act of drinking. However, there are even more extreme states of trance consciousness one can experience than simply working a dead-end job and getting drunk on the weekends. The mind can hallucinate when exposed to certain entheogenic plant medicines or their psychoactive ingredients in extract tinctures, and both see and hear objects, events, and even lifelike beings that are purely the products of their own imaginations. Likewise, on the other end of the spectrum of such trans-consciousness mind states, one can totally psychically dissociate from their physical body to such an extent their ego or primary self-concept blacks out and experiences missing time while a second self or alter persona takes over control of the person's body. This extreme dissociative state is usually associated with trauma or with ketamine abuse or heroin addiction chemically. Magic and mental illness. How dangerous is practicing magic? As I have said before, there are various differing types of magic that have varying different types of results on and for their practitioner. Aleister Crowley defined magic as willpower and so claimed every act is a magical act. This is similar to the old Buddhist saying, before attaining nirvana, chop wood, carry water, after attaining nirvana, chop wood, carry water. So there is, of course, simple household magic, such as jumping a broom in a doorway to wed, or placing indigenous animal totems on one's hearth for luck. But ceremonial magic is much more immersive. Ceremonial magic involves using a vast barrage of sensory stimuli and meditative trance-inducing techniques to effectively suspend one's disbelief in the efficacy of imaginary magic. Certain spells and pacts made while in a ceremonial magical 
ritual and or in a hallucinogenic trance long enough to convince oneself it works. So, in short, during the ritual magical ceremony, the sane and rational mind has to be discarded, and the insane and irrational mind has to be embraced instead. Theoretically, one then turns this experience off, like snuffing out a candle, by using a banishing ritual at the end. However, if one has tasked the spirit, ghost, genie, demon, angel, or god they invoked with anything, then their working is not truly closed until this task has been verifiably accomplished. Only then can their servitor truly be banished. So doing such ceremonial magic in an attempt to summon a servitor to accomplish the will of the magician is basically like taking a brief vacation from sanity and passing over into the underworld of pure lunacy by taking a leap of faith that one will be able to return to their right mind. In short, magic isn't naturally real, but it becomes more real the more people put faith in it such that, from the perspective of sober sanity, all magic is fake, and at most psychosomatically effective alone, due to the self-deceiving, due to the self-deceiving placebo effect, and anyone who has practiced it has experienced temporary insanity from doing so. Likewise, when people have shallow desires and only practice ceremonial magic to attain simple trick simple trinkets like a home, a car, a spouse, money, etc., then they are likely to be able to attain these by magic without much risk to their long-term sanity. However, if one trifles with magical art and ceremonial craft, and does so for any deeper understanding, or prays for greater personal wisdom using ceremony to summon some knowledge bringer to intercede on their behalf and reveal to them facts it would have otherwise been impossible for them to know, especially should these facts prove true, tests the sanity of the aspirant practitioner much more. Practice of ceremonial magic leads one toward assigning meaning to otherwise meaningless coincidences and thus to chasing after synchronicities where none would exist if one were of a sober and sane state of mind. Thus, the entire suspension of disbelief required for the placebo effect of magic to psychosomatically take effect can be considered a form of at least temporary mental illness as it deviates from what is considered social functionality by quite a vast amount. Anyone who would think they could practice ceremonial magic in public at random will likely eventually end up hauled off to a mental asylum at least. Although it has been my personal experience that, no matter how much psychic damage practicing ceremonial magic may accomplish, a visit to a mental asylum is far more injurious to one's psyche than voluntarily practicing magic by one's self could ever be. And his next question. Did John D. actually speak to guardian angels? John D. and Edward Kelly created a cryptography system so complex that it put both that it put both into an altered state of consciousness just to study it. This system, called the heptarchical or binorum method, 
was then combined with ritual scrying through a crystal ball in order to create a double blind method to factor out random error. The result of this was D and Kelly's invention or rediscovery of the host of Enochian angels, intelligences and caco demons, etc., derived from the subsequent system of 92 sigils of seven letters each atop the four watchtowers and across the 30 concentric rings of the heirs and so forth. So essentially, D invented a system of cryptography, the Benorum, that Kelly combined with scrying for both to develop Enochian magic together. There are hundreds of different names of different types of servitor that may be evoked from these Enochian watchtower tables, each with its own pre-specified type of task it is most useful for. Although it is a vast circuit board, anyone with time and patience to work this system until they at least understand it will benefit from doing so, at least insofar as by expanding their minds to have learned this new information. As a mnemonic for improving memory, alike a Kabbalah, as a complexly enciphered puzzle, alike a 12 by 13 cells per side Rubik's Cube, and as a prototypical form of paper machine model, alike what we would call today a cybernetic computer, the Enochian system of D and Kelly is highly advanced intellectually and was so far ahead of its time for them, it proved useless at gaining the material wealth as while they were in Europe developing this system, Dee's library back home in England was being robbed and plundered. So what Dee did was create a method for communicating to his own deeper psychic levels of consciousness, the heptarchical bonorum, that served as a method of interface between his sober, sane, waking life and the times during which he was practicing this system of Enochian magic. He then invoked a guide from beyond his sober, sane, mundane mind through this switchboard-like encryption system. And this guide or projected detachment of his own psyche then showed his ego or central self-concept how to step through this screen separating the mundane realm from the magical, the natural from the supernatural, etc. However, once having gained access to this limitless realm, where anything one may imagine may be instantaneously manifested, D brought with him the psychic baggage of the complex system he designed. So we now have the Enochian system of the four watchtowers as a work D brought back with him when he returned from this nether world of pure imagination that he accessed mentally by creating his complex encryption method. So, in short, D created a threshold between the real and the imaginary dimensions, stepped across it from the real into the realm of pure mind, and returned from this with the Enochian system's model intact. And, insofar as this system may be able to embody a fourth spatial dimensional tesseract shaped metaphor as well alike hakagabala itself it may indeed be used to contact more intelligent orders of beings who is area kaplan and has his and has he influenced your work Area Kaplan, 1934 until 1983, was an American Orthodox rabbi and Hebrew scholar of Torah and Kabbalah. Kaplan's translation of the essential Kabbalistic work, Sefer Yetzirah, meaning the Book of Splendor, was released in 1997, and I personally studied it thoroughly, hot off the presses. 
I immediately recognized it was a more significant addition than the scaled down version translated by William Wynne Westcott in 1913, as Kaplan's 97 had numerous diagrams and charts the Westcott 13 lacked. These diagrams and charts have proved absolutely integral to my own understanding of Kabbalah, so I would say far more than any other works of his, Area Kaplan's Sefer Yetzera was formative for my earliest ideas on what Kabbalah meant, how it was done, etc. Kabbalah, as it is described in the form of the 32 mystical paths of wisdom in Sefer Yetzera, is usually presented by the diagram of the Tree of Life model, with 10 Sephirot emanations at its corners and 22 paths for running and returning between these along its edges. In Sefer Yetzirah, the text breaks this set of 22 paths down further by associating each to a letter from the ancient Hebrew alphabet and each of these to either one of the seven classical planets of antiquity, one of the twelve signs of the tropical zodiac's constellations, or one of three mother letters symbolizing the three phases of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. The Sefer Yetzirah introduces this tree of life lattice as a memory castle model, onto which it assigns the Hebrew letters and these astrological and alchemical attributes as mnemonics. The text itself is incredibly simple, but Kaplan's commentary on it is indispensable for comprehending more of the fullness of its implications. What is Enochian magic? What uses does it have? Nowadays, the answer to that depends entirely on who you ask, because there are many different independent and group practitioners who follow very different traditions and schools of thought about it. For example, in Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible, one of Dee's Calls of the Heirs is quoted, but the name of the angel being invoked in Dee's original is replaced with the name Satan. Likewise, in Aleister Crowley's work, The Vision and the Voice, he adds more such calls in the Enochian language and describes their effects as being very much different from the more placid visions of Dee. In the knowledge lectures of the original modern members of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, a system is described that has since come to be called Neo-Enochian, that assigns each cell on D's four watchtowers its own elemental attribute per column and row, as well as a corresponding zodiac sign attribute derived from a crossing of these elements per row and column. So, for example... Aries was the result of the crossing of, Aries was the result at the crossing of the element of fire for a row with the element of fire for a column, the sign of Scorpio a crossing of water and water, Gemini of air and air, etc. Much of this neo enochian work was the product of S. L. Mathers, 1854 until 1918, writing as Frater S. R. M. D and remains understood by very few even today. Of course, the original Enochian system of magic, as it was designed by or imparted to John D. and Edward Kelly from 1582 until 1587, consists of the usual liturgical chants to be intoned as prayers, the 18 out of 30 calls of the heirs, and the four watchtower tables as a layman, onto which are assembled the 91, actually 92, sigils of the intelligences of the places in the earth. 
Although there is no real evidence of any goetic influence on D in the Enochian magic system, Merrick Kausaban, an early D biographer, suggests there was such, and so since then, many have confused the arrangement actually used by D for discoursing with the Enochian angels, and that used in standard ceremonial magic or ritual summoning, such as in the Goetia and other grimoires. Therefore, rather than assemble the components of his rituals as D himself did, many modern magi would prefer to use the Goetic model of ceremonial summoning as a shortcut for manifesting the intelligences D's method only allows communication with more indirectly, via scrying. The combination of Goetia and Enochian magic systems should not be dove into recklessly, as did Crowley by publishing certain Goetic curses translated into the Enochian language in his appendix to Mather's edition of the Lesser Keys of Solomon Grimoire. Recall that D, while off designing a system of magic to search for buried treasure, had his library raided and his home ransacked, and that Crowley, who added his curses among the calls of the heirs as authentic Enochian translations, suffered a lifelong addiction to heroin, and you may be reminded why practicing this method of magic could be considered dangerous to one's overall welfare and general well-being. Is there any truth to Lawrence Gardner's research on the bloodlines of the Holy Grail? Yes. In his works, Genesis of the Grail Kings, Bloodline of the Holy Grail, and Realm of the Ring Lords, Lawrence Gardner, 1943 until 2010, presents the direct lineages as family trees for every generation, tracing back from at least the lifetime of Jacques de Molay, 1240 to 1314 AD, to at least that of Nebuchadnezzar II, who ruled in Babylon from 605 until 562 BC. These documents appear to substantiate several fringe and speculative claims made, for example, in Fritz Sprigmeier's Bloodlines of the Illuminati, about modern rich elite families all being interrelated, and claims made, for example, in Jim Marr's book, Rule by Secrecy, about the descent of all the modern ruling elites from an original Babylonian brotherhood that dated back at least as far as ancient Sumer and the Levant. In Gardner's records, which also tie in with the controversial translations of Zacharias Sitchin, the original civilizers of humankind were extraterrestrials who not only created our species in a test tube, but later also bred with us to spawn a subspecies of hybrid giants. These extraterrestrials became the pantheons of gods in all ancient cultures according to this tradition. He finds that Yahweh and Allah are merely modern derivations of names for the Sumerian twin gods Enlil and Enki, respectively. Wherever Gardner got these family tree documents, they remain of major usefulness to anyone who wants to study this line of thinking in the modern genre of conspiracy theories. They relate that Jesus had children who became the Merovingian kings of France, a popular claim among the modern descendants of these deposed monarchs, and that Jesus survived the crucifixion by having been anointed in a chrism that contained monoatomic gold, allowing Jesus to leave his body and return to it any time he wished, a claim that popularizes the fringe science of ingesting superconductive monoatomic platinum group elements by giving it a long historical context and precedent. Again, according to Gardner's research, presented in his work, Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark, the role of such monoatomic gold 
was pivotal in the ultimate fate of the Ark, of the covenant artifact itself. Of course, because many of his claims are based on argument by way of absence. Of course, because many of his claims are based on argument by way of absence of evidence rather than its presence. Many of his claims remain considered pseudoscience, even though eventually they will all likely be proven true. And that will wrap up the seventh broadcast for now. Uh, Andrews has submitted more questions, but I'm going to return to those in a subsequent podcast and uh, call it for now. Uh, thanks, everybody who's tuned in. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Uh, and for tolerating my boring uh, and and disinterested sounding uh dissociating voice uh my my monotonous uh narcolepsy inducing uh vocal tonality uh i hope everyone has had a, a wonderful time and uh i'll catch you in the next one uh peace